As we approach our last week of exploring the arts, we're going to be looking at art and the spiritual, the human condition, romanticism, and the sublime. Let's wrap up our tour through the arts where we began with verses from the Psalms. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. These famous verses can always inspire us, but by now you're probably able to recognize some of the oratorical figures of speech that make up free verse. Parallelism, anaphora, catalog. This week we're going to focus on the spiritual dimensions of art. We'll look again at religious art and at art that explores spiritual themes not always in an overtly religious way. The oldest human arts that we have preserved reflect a numinous reality, the natural commingling with a sense of the divine that's present everywhere. So in this scene from the marshes of the Nile in ancient Egypt, we see a river scene with rushes and birds and so forth, and we see symbols of social authority authorized by the gods who are indicated by divine symbols in those upper registers to the right. Art has been infused by the religious and the spiritual since its ancient origins. About 6,000 years ago in southeastern Mesopotamia, Accountants who were responsible to track stores and shipments of grain and other goods developed writing. Among other things, they developed cylinder seals, which they would roll over wet clay to inscribe documents with divine authority. The example you have in your book shows one god, Ninurta, presenting a captured bird to another goddess, Ea. Now, in that world, there was no distinction between the political and the religious. It was simply assumed that any city that gained precedence over another did so because some god or goddess preferred the one city. And so in the tale and Merkar and the Lord of Arata, the residents of Arata are grieving because the goddess, Holy Inanna, has abandoned them to give the primacy to the lord of Uruk, another city. As we've suggested before, one of the prime reasons for religious art is to teach lessons. And the art of the medieval church, for example, was designed to instruct illiterate laypeople in the faith. This image is of the Dormition of the Virgin. The image was part of a movement by which the Virgin Mary was raised to a sense of presence among the people. Legends were told in sermons and stories of miracles performed by Mary bringing grace to common lives. Now, Dormition refers to the tradition that developed over time that Mary did not die physically, but was translated to heaven in the same way that Elijah was in the Old Testament. Another dimension of religious art is the prophetic, which in essence consists of words of divine judgment on wayward human society. And this generally involves challenges to conventional social values. So here we see an image of a Buddhist prophet who travels Japan challenging the religion of the day which focused on the wealthy and the aristocratic. He brought Buddhist inspiration to the common people. In his advice to a young poet, the Catholic priest Thomas Merton brings a poetic voice to our society. He notes with disdain 
some of the aspects of America that a young poet or a young person of faith needs to be aware of in order to maintain the faith in a dark time. Of course, as we've said before, much religious art is intended to aid people in worship, and often apse domes above high altars in churches, like this transfiguration of Christ, are intended to elevate one's thoughts to worship. So is Gerard Manley Hopkins' God's Grandeur. This is a sonnet of faith, and it's a vision of the holy erupting remarkably, surprisingly, in everyday life. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge, and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And, for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness, deep down things, and though the last lights off the black west went, oh, morning, at the brown brink, eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with, ah, bright wings. What do you see and hear in this poem? Images? The thematic turn in the sonnet? Parallel passages? Anaphora? You're ready to process a poem like this now. A great deal of art is religious. But a great deal of art is not religious. Often, art that is not overtly religious nevertheless probes spiritual themes. Let's offer a working definition of what we mean by the spiritual in art. A mysterious human inwardness, hungering to transcend life and death and connect with forces of creation. These spiritual themes can be traced back to the Epic of Gilgamesh, one of the world's first literary narratives. It's the story of a half-divine king who fights in heroic battles and constructs cities and has a friendship with a wild man named Enkidu. But then Enkidu dies and Gilgamesh is consumed by grief. He talks about the doom of mortals that overtook his friend and he was afraid that he too would die. What became of my friend was too much to bear, so I wander the wild. How can I keep silent? How can I stay quiet? My friend is turned to clay. Shall I not be like him and also lie down, never to rise again through all eternity? Gilgamesh goes on a journey to the end of the earth to learn the truth of human mortality. And this is the fundamental human problem which artists have explored throughout the ages, a discovery of the inevitability of one's own death and the mystery of the afterlife. In Holy Sonnet number 10, John Donne explores this theme. It's a sonnet of paradoxes, the triumph of death over human beings, but then the overcoming of death by the grace of Christ. The first stanza looks at the pride of death, which seems to be so triumphant, but yet it claims that death cannot have the last word. There's a comparison to rest and sleep, which are sort of like death and aren't so bad. And then the poet challenges death to realize that poppy or charms can make us sleep as well. Then the great triumphant 
couplet expresses Dunn's faith in Christ. One short sleep past, we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. In Emily Dickinson's famous poem number 479, the theological conviction isn't quite as clear. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. We slowly drove. He knew no haste. And I had put away my labor and my leisure, too, for his civility. We passed the school where children strove at recess in the ring. We passed the fields of grazing grain, the setting sun. Or rather, he passed us. The dews grew quivering and chill, for only gossamer my gown, my tippet only tool. We paused before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible, the cornice in the ground. Since then, tis centuries, and yet feels shorter than the day I first surmised the horses' heads were toward eternity. Here Dickinson's imagination tries to project what might follow after death. Now we've seen this painting by Rembrandt before, and it has a remarkable quality, one that's called by the Italian term chiaroscuro. The Oxford Dictionary defines this as the effects of light and shade in a work of art, particularly when they're strongly contrasting. He mentions Leonardo and then the great practitioner of chiaroscuro, Rembrandt, as we see in this picture. Now, chiaroscuro has a subtly spiritual artistic effect. It's not didactic or dogmatic. There's no direct reference to the Bible or anything. But the light and shadow here evoke primordial human values. Darkness, the mystery realm from which we arise and to which we return. And light, the suggestion of spiritual grace, the touch of the divine. One way to see light and dark are as archetypes. By this term, we refer to a recurring symbol, theme, setting, or character type. And we find them in myths, in literature, and folklore, and in dreams and rituals. They tend to embody an essential element of what we might think of as universal human experience. The rose, the serpent, the sun. Themes like love, death, and conflict. Mythical sitting, settings like the paradisal garden. And stock characters, the femme fatale, the hero, the magician. Basic patterns of action and plot. The quest, the descent to the underworld. Notice the spiritual and religious dimensions of archetype. And the most fundamental of these patterns, death and rebirth, the natural cycle of the seasons. Swiss psychologist Carl Gustav Jung argued that symbols in dreams and myths are residues of ancestral memory preserved in a collective unconscious. Light is archetypal. It's spiritual. And remember this painting by Rembrandt that we saw last week? It's a biblical subject, but let's pretend that we don't know that. Let's just look at it and see men on a frail sailing vessel. They're perched and vulnerable above the roiling, destructive element of the sea. They're shrouded in the fathomless darkness of the heavens, but they're touched by divine grace, saving light piercing the darkness. Spiritual dimensions of light and darkness. In 18th century Europe, a neoclassical age of reason reacted against the horrible violence of the previous century which had followed the Protestant Reformation. In this time, the empirical method that we think of as science emerged. There was a conviction that reason governs and illuminates the human spirit. Neoclassical art reflected Greco-Roman tradition, 
It reflected cool composition, balance, symmetry, disciplined lines, images of human ideals, and fidelity to tradition. And then came the so-called Romantic Revolution of the 19th century, a reaction against the cult of reason, a celebration of human inwardness, using the imagination within the individual as a gateway to wisdom. William Blake was an English engraver and poet. He believed in the imagination. And so, for example, in his Marriage of Heaven and Hell, he said things that sounded paradoxical and were challenging the idea that reason was king. The road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom. Without contraries is no progression. Attraction and repulsion, reason and energy, love and hate are necessary to human existence. From these contraries spring what the religious call good and evil. Good is the passive that obeys reason. Evil is the active, springing from energy. Although he was not well known in his lifetime, Blake stood on the cusp of the Romantic Age, a profound shift in Western attitudes that rejected the ordered rationality of the Enlightenment and the decorous imitation of classical models. Romanticism embraced the individual and the individual self-expression, sincerity, spontaneity, and originality, emotional directness, and the boundlessness of individual imagination. One of the examples of Romanticism was a new wave of women novelists like Mary Shelley, George Sand, and the Bronte sisters, who broke the imposed restraints of modesty in works of powerful imaginative force. In order to consider one of the key concepts of Romanticism, let's look once again at Rembrandt's painting. What is your aesthetic response? Are you seeing beauty here? Well, perhaps. But you imagine yourself in this boat. What would you feel? Fear? Exhilaration? The adrenaline rush of being on the portal of eternity? But you see, you're not there. You view the painting and imagine it's seen from a place of safety. This is an aesthetic response. Fear minus actual danger. And this is what the Romantics meant by the sublime. It's an aesthetic response. It's distinct from the beautiful or the picturesque, and it's distinct from the survival instinct. It's a delicious stimulation of fear and apprehension, but in the absence of danger. It focuses on ideas of awe and vastness, the opening out of eternity. For example, if we are sitting on, this, on the seashore and we watch a storm at sea, we see its power and majesty, but we're safe. And we can have the same experience looking at an evocative painting. Or perhaps we read tales of horror. For example, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which she wrote in 1818. Since the 19th century, the sublime has been an important factor in art. Here we see Claude Laurent's seaport with the embarkation of the Queen of Sheba, and it contains some of the common features of the sublime, a contrast in scale. We see tiny human figures in the foreground or middle distance, and then vast landscapes, the canopy of the heavens, which are often pierced with light, connecting the imagination out into the boundlessness of eternity. Normally, images of the sublime are placed out of doors, but here we see the sublime achieved within the interior of a Gothic cathedral. The painting, with its tiny human figures and its soaring pointed arches, corresponds to the intention of great church architecture, which was always to lift the mind out of the human realm and raise it toward the heavens and the eternal. In general, the sublime tends to engage our spiritual hunger to connect with the eternal. And here in 
Caspar David Friedrich's picture, we see a contemplative monk standing on a seashore, a tiny human figure addressing himself to the vastness of infinity. In the early 19th century, a group of painters, led in part by Thomas Cole, cultivated the effects of the sublime. They've been referred to as the Hudson River School. And in this image, we see again the evocation of a transhuman vastness opening out into infinity. Some of Frederick Edwin Church's paintings of a Mexican volcano are idyllic. This one seems to partake of the primordial, almost the origins of the earth, as we see the sun behind a blood-red sky. At first glance, The Oxen by Thomas Hardy seems to recall, nostalgically, the moment when the poet was told as a child that at 12 o'clock on Christmas Eve, all of the animals would take a knee in order to honor Christ. But when we look more closely, we see ironic suggestions of doubt. So fair a fancy few would weave in these years. And then he goes along with it in his memory, hoping it might be so, but probably not believing. We see in this poem the emergence of a skeptical age, which was in part disillusioned by World War I and by rationalism. One of the most challenging poetic voices of the 20th century was Wallace Stevens, a poet of disillusionment who operated in an age of growing doubt and faced a daunting challenge. How do you make sense of the world without referring to a higher spiritual realm? How do you see the world we experience stripped of mythic delusions? The problem is that human consciousness always sees the world in human terms. Personification, the human side of perception, the effects of the world on human feeling. For example, if we think of winter's cold, how do we think of it as pure fact? How do we think of it without thinking of the shiver of cold human beings? So Stephen's poem, The Snowman, it seems deceptively simple, but raises profound questions. One must have a mind of winter to regard the frost and the boughs of the pine trees crusted with snow and have been cold a long time to behold the junipers shagged with ice, the spruces rough in the distant glitter of the January sun, and not to think of any misery in the sound of the wind, in the sound of a few leaves, which is the sound of the land full of the same wind that is blowing in the same bare place for the listener who listens in the snow and nothing himself beholds nothing that is not there and the nothing that is. In the 1920s, in her apartment in Paris, Gertrude Stein coined a term for the young men who returned from World War I. She called them the lost generation. They were shocked and disillusioned by the horrors of trench warfare. And in general, the world seemed to be stripped of its belief in the progress of human society and of tradition. Ernest Hemingway was scarred as a child by his father's suicide. He was a journalist for the Kansas City Star, who then served as a combat ambulance driver in World War I. He became a novelist of disillusionment and despair. He was a pioneer of a stripped, terse style of writing. And he probed the existential problem, confronting human mortality, recognizing how the prospect of death subverts conventional human meaning and then seeking a reason to live without illusion. In a clean, well-lighted place, Hemingway poses the spiritual problem of faithlessness. 
It's a bare, stripped-down story, set in a cantina in Spain, in which an old man answers the disillusionments of mortality with light and order. There's an internal monologue of despair. What did he fear? Not a fear or dread. It was a nothing that he knew too well. All a nothing, and a man was nothing too. There's an ironic parody of the Lord's Prayer, which replaces the familiar words with the Spanish word nada, which means nothing. And it goes on to offer a similar parody of the Hail Mary ritual. Hail, nothing, full of nothing, nothing is with thee. And in the end, the old man smiles and stands before a bar with a shining steam pressure coffee machine. We've been sampling, ever so briefly, art's engagement of spiritual issues. Art, after all, probes all dimensions of the human heart, including the spiritual, faith and doubt, evil and righteousness, sin and grace, light and darkness, mortality and the hope of eternity. We have much to learn from the arts, and we have much to learn from the art of the Bible. The lamentations of Job are found in the Old Testament, a brilliant example of wisdom literature. It's a lamentation over the trials of human life, the prosperity of the wicked, the elusiveness of justice, the challenge of mortality. But Job, beset by doubt, beset by challenges, beset by suffering, answers with a triumphant proclamation of faith. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been thus destroyed, then in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see on my side, and my eyes shall behold, and not another.